Lord, grant me the serenity to understand the things I cannot change. Grant me the courage to change the things that I can. And grant me the wisdom to know the difference. Just for today. Amen. You close to the edge, just don't move. My brother said his lawyer just gave him some bad news. Police found the drugs that were stashed in the bathroom. Not only that, but his court date approaching us fast too. So tell me what to do. Lord, you only seek the truth. If you want to bear fruit, then he needs to abide in you. If you seek transformation, it happens in solitude. Since I never had a shot, God threw me the alley hoop. I believe I can fly. Let me mingle with the angels. Heaven's in my periphery. I see it from my angle. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's your boy, bro Troy. Bro Smith. And bro Kirk. And we are the Bro, bro Code. Make sure to like this post right now. Not now, fellas, but when? Like right, right, right now. now. For all of those who are already supporting the, the podcast and the brand, thank you. If you haven't already, go to YouTube at Bro Code TV Productions, as well as at Instagram at, at Bro Code Show. Well, fellas, I think we, uh, oh, hold on. <laughs> Another one. Real quick, though, man, we are at the... Central University, man. I remember a couple years back we were sitting up at the bleachers and we said, look, we're going to be sent to court one day. And we didn't know who, what, how that would happen. So here we are two years later. We say everything is a collective effort. And tonight we've got the man, the myth, the legend. Yeah, Bill Moten. yeah man. The coach yeah. of uh, North Carolina Central University, man. Well, Central, uh, Bell, it's good to have you, man. Glad to be here. And Thank you for coming on the Broco Show, man. It's been a while, man. Long overdue. Long overdue. Break out some kinks. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Indeed, but we made it happen. We made it happen, man. Now, Lavelle, we know who you are, man. We are right here in Durham, North Carolina. But for those who are listening Mm -hmm. or maybe watching this, man, run us your resume in 90 seconds or less. Lord, that's a lot. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Head basketball coach at North Carolina Central University, um, chairman of the Vail Cares Foundation. But basketball and that other stuff, that's what I do. It's not who I am. I'm a husband. Mm. I'm a father. Um, I'm a philanthropist. Um, I'm a great friend to anybody that's my friend. Um, One third founder member of Riley Ray's Development. I uh, have our own construction and development company. Shout out to CJ Mann and Terrell Midget. Yeah. Um, again, the Vail Cares Foundation. Um, you know, it's just so much to run off, man. Um, but that's that's pretty much it. Just just try to be a man and a, a pillar in the community um, to be a blessing just to help other people, man. So that's who I am in a nutshell. Yeah, we're going to get into all of that. Yeah. All of that, man. Yeah. Lane Street is in the building, man. Yes, 27610, stand yes, up. Sir. South Side. Well, hardest question. We're going to start, we're gonna, we're gonna start you off like We're going to ease right into this. Right. I once heard that you got a nickname. Name. Was, is, it, is it Puff? Yeah, Puff. So I was raised by my grandmother. Bro, bro Kurt was raised by his grandmother. Single mom, grandparents played a huge role. Yeah. Now, my grandmother's name was Nana. Right. What was, what was your grandmother's name, and how did you get that, that nickname? It was hers with Maddie McDougal, and she just called me Puffy because I was fat when I was a baby, <laughs> right? So it was just like, yeah, you look back at my baby pictures. I ain't miss a meal. I don't yeah. know what they were feeding me, yeah. but... I was eating like table food (laughs) when I was like six months or something. So I just got big and she just called me Puffy and it stuck, right? And so um, even you remember those baby shoes that our parents would have? They would get them bronze. (laughs) And so I looked at my baby shoes that my mom and my grandma had bronze for me and underneath the bottom it had Puffy all Uh. written in Ashton Stone. So it's Puff, man. Yeah. Yeah. I heard so much so that you, you, you flipped it a little bit for your baby girl. Yeah. And she's stuff. She's stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. how did that, well, did that just flip? You was know it, what? it was just, I, it was a, it was subconsciously, like when she was born, I just kept saying stuff, stuff, stuff. <laughs> and she, you know, it just stuck. You know, nicknames yeah. just, yeah. just happen to stick. They just come in a, in a barrage of, of, time and things like that man so i was just calling the stuff and she just kept answering and instead of saying brooke i would just say stuff and it just stuck to this day so <laughs> now it rhymes with puff so now we puff and stuff puff and stuff i love it so vj didn't get in on that 
He was, Lil Puff. Lil Puff. Right. Okay. So he Lil Puff. I, 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 yeah, he Lavelle I, I, Moat Jr. So he, he yeah. Lavelle Jr. So he Lil Puff. You so when saying? when nicknames go around the house, he LP. Yeah. He LP. Yeah. Or, or, or Lil, Lil Puff. Puff. Okay. Yeah, Lil I can Puff. dig that. I can so. dig that. You spoke of one of your childhood friends, Terrell Major. Shout out to Terrell. We got a chance to interview him. What up, Terrell? In another episode, you guys are doing great things. But he told me about a time in the interview, he mentioned two words. One being back on Lane Street, y'all was in the neighborhood, and you were in the refrigerator, and he mentioned two words, molasses and coleslaw. Yeah, let me, let me clear that up for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's time to discuss. <laughs> and it was, right? Um, we, we all went to the Boys Club. Shout out to the Boys Club, 605 Raleigh Boulevard. Mm -hmm. like, it changed everyone's life, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And like during lunchtime, Terrell grew up on, uh, what was it, um, King Charles Road, near that area, mm -hmm. right? And at the time, that was a affluent neighborhood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. we were like, hold on, bro. Yeah. So during lunchtime, we all had like bologna sandwiches or whatever, had to hustle to eat. His mom and dad would bring him like Hardee's and I'm like, yo, what's going on? <laughs> Homie got some money, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I sorted them out and I just, we just became friends. Then one day I was like, yo, let me spend the night with you, bro. Like, my whole motive was to go over there and just Get some eat. Grub. Right? Because I was like, yo, you eating like this. I see how you living. So, you know, let me go to the crib, whatever, check you out. You know, we kids. He yeah. called my mom, said, Ms. Moon, can Bill spend the night? She said, yeah, okay. We get over there, man, and it's a Friday. And, you know, we just hanging out, chilling, whatever, whatever. And I just like, okay, let's, let's get to it. You know, let's open the refrigerator. <laughs> Man, I look in that dude refrigerator. His mom's not home. I look in that dude refrigerator. We like 10, 11 years old at the time. And this molasses and coleslaw and water <laughs> with bread on top of the refrigerator. <laughs> I said, bro, I could stay home for this. You know what I'm saying? Like, what? This is how you look? Yo, we were starving. We ate molasses and coleslaw. Mm. As soon as we finished eating, his mom come in the house with groceries. I was like, man, take me home. I'm so mad. So. <laughs> Shout out to Terrell, man. That was like the the inception and the origin of our friendship right there. Indeed, it's indeed. Still the test of time. I appreciate you clearing that up because when he first told us, I was like, I don't know about all that, man. Yeah, bro. <laughs> Last but not least, Coach, man, you, basketball has been a huge part of your life, man. Mm -hmm. it, it, they even named the park after you, the same park where we remember you shooting till the streetlights mm -hmm. came on and mm -hmm. stayed on, man, until someone called you in. And you talk about it changing your life. Is there a favorite basketball movie that you have? One that kind of relates to you? Whew, man, the one that, the one that kind of changed my life and my perspective, like we all got our favorite ones. Like I love loving basketball mm -hmm. and we love uh, Coach Carter and, you know, mm -hmm. um, but the one that changed my life was the fish that saved Pittsburgh. I don't know if y'all old enough to remember that. You remember that one? Like, yo, I was a kid, bro. I don't know, man. <laughs> I was a kid, and I just remember being at the boys' club, and they were showing a movie called The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was crazy. It was a team based out of Pittsburgh, and um, the whole team was centered around astrology, right? So mm -hmm. they just got all Pisces. Right. So the lady, the general manager came in and they just selected doing trials. You had to be a Pisces to make mm. the team because she just thought, you know, with the <laughs> horoscope thing and the signs. Like, right. Yeah. And so Dr. J just happened to be on the basketball okay. team. And then the championship, they played against the Lakers. And I was like, yo, that's magic. Norm Nixon, Kareem. Wow. And so as a kid, that just locked you in. So that's my favorite movie of all mm. time. man. Um, mm. in terms of basketball, yeah. like um, the fish that say Pittsburgh. Y'all got to check it out, bro. I got to ask yeah. the fellas too, man. Favorite one? I got one, but I want to hear from the fellas, man. Any favorite, like, basketball movie? Oh, my, uh, mine's White Man Can't Jump. Okay. Yeah. Take it back. Yeah. Woody. Yeah. 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 Wesley. I know yeah. anytime yeah. that comes on, you know. Oh, you I, watch the whole movie? Oh, yeah. All day. You start saying the lines? All day. Yeah. I know a, a bunch of foods that start with Q because of that. Man, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, that's good, man. I like that one, too. I think that's when I really started liking Rosie, too. Oh, yeah. I was like, ooh. Yeah. 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 I just saw it in the yeah. other day. Yeah, too. yeah. 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 That did the right thing, tough. that she, she's, on, she's on point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was tough. What I'm going to go with Above the Rim. Just from a point, right? Just from a point of... Kyle, mm. single mom, mm -hmm. Hooper. Kyle Watson, right? Kyle Watson, Kyle baby. Watson. But all the things he had to go through 
navigating the friendships, mm. dealing with Birdie. Yeah, drug dealing. Yeah, all, yeah. That, that's, real. Yeah. that's yeah. real. That's Pop. For those that don't know about that movie, yeah. Pop real. Birdie. Shout out to Bud the Rim. I forgot about <laughs> you that. You forgot that one? Yeah. He brought it back? Yeah. I got one for you, Coach. Watch this. So mine is Blue Chips. I love that. That oh, was my first that. time <laughs> I saw Shaq and Penny like yeah. go at it in a movie. Love and that. I was introduced to that that duo, yeah. you know, through a movie. A movie Some great basketball. Yeah, movie. man. Yeah, yeah, you can go on for days about yeah. basketball yeah, movies, man. Go on and on. Absolutely, that, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Well, let's chew the meat and spit out the bone. What you got, bro? Yeah, man, it, it's it's wild being in here, Coach. You <laughs> know, I, I've seen a game or two in here, but I've never had the chance to go into the locker room and uh, experience what it, it feels like, yeah. in, in a sense, to be mm. a collegiate ball player. And um, seeing your face all over the place, uh, it, it's it's humbling to me mm-hmm. seeing your face mm-hmm. on, on the wall. Um, you know, one of the most winningest coaches in basketball mm-hmm. history, mm-hmm. what two-time All-American, mm-hmm. you know, four-time NCAA tournament appearance. And, and I, I love how you said basketball is what you do, and not who you are. Right. You know, you have a number of slashes: the mm-hmm. author, right. business owner. Right. I, I'm hoping we could get to know a little bit more about you. Right. You know, I, I've, I know a little bit of your story, but for our audience, take us back to Boston. Right. You know, what were you like as a child? You know, what were some of your influences mm-hmm. growing up, and how did you even gravitate to the sport of, of basketball? Yeah, that's a good question, man. I was mischievous <laughs> as a kid. Um, born in Roxbury, Massachusetts, born in Boston. Shout out to Orchard Park. Um, you know, it was crazy, man. Like, everybody really thought that you live fast and you die young and whatever happens in between just happens and you've forgotten about because no one in Orchard Park pretty much made it out, right? It was considered like Vietnam and you got to understand this is like the inception of crack cocaine mm-hmm. and um, it was it was just crazy, man. Like I can't even describe everything. The, the movie, I put it like this in a nutshell, the movie New Jack City mm-hmm is based on a character from Orchard Park that Mm. resided in Orchard Park, right? So Mm. it's like, shout out to Barry Michael Cooper who wrote the movie, New Jack City. Central grad also, by the way. And I don't know if y'all seen the uh, movie, um, I think it's In Too Deep with LL Cool J. Mm -hmm. And that's based off Orchard Park. Like that's that's us, right? So that character LL Cool J played is a character from Orchard Park. So what happened was during that time, man, and during the drug game, you had a bunch of drug dealers that was migrating into Orchard Park and just taking over projects and apartments, right? And if it was easy access where, you know, they could provide the work and it was one way where they could give it to you, you pay and just keep going and go out to cut, like it was a perfect way. So if you lived on that strip, they were just invading your space, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like through force. And um, for me, like it was really difficult navigating that, I'll be completely honest with you, because you would walk outside and you'd be like, oh, like, what am I really going to do with my life, mm-hmm. right? Um, the projects have a certain way of humbling you, right? It's, it's, when you live in the projects, it's almost like you see the plan that America has devised against you every single day. And subconsciously, you're made to feel like you're nothing, mm. right? Because it's you and in the hallways and broken glass everywhere and roaches and rats and so on and so forth. And you like, yo, like, then it's a big fence that's put up and you like, is this fence designed to keep mm. me away from them or them away from me or just keep me embedded in here, right? So subconsciously it just messes with you. I'm always thankful, man, because um, also in our projects, we had five or six guys that was older than us and by the name of New Edition. Hmm. And they won a talent show. Um, and talent shows was this thing, so we ain't think nothing of it. Um, none of us had cable TV, so we weren't really watching it and verifying it. It was just we did talent shows every day or every weekend at, at Roscoe's. And whoever won, won like five, ten, twenty dollars or whatever. And you get a pickle, jungle juice, some chips and try to do it again. That's what it was. And they won this talent show. And I remember my mom calling me in the house saying, Puffy, Puffy, come here. You got to see this. And she got the TV on Soul Train, and now they're on Soul Train. Mm. And I was like, what in the hell? Like, that just mm. changed my entire life. My building, I stayed on Adams Street, so Raph and Rick stayed in my building. Mike stayed across the projects. Bob stayed over here. Um, but seeing them, it just did something to me. It let me know, like, yo, regardless of the circumstances and the outcome, 
you too can make it out of here, right? And so I went out and rounded up four of my homeboys and we became the next edition, right? <laughs> like, Not new edition. Yeah, we're going to be the next edition. So we were going to get out these projects. I had the plan. I, I was like the Barry Gordy. I had the, the mastermind, man. And, and, you know, it, obviously it ain't work out that mm. way. But what it did, it taught me trying to perfect their routines. It taught me hard work. It taught me discipline. Their choreographer, and this is all weird, man. This is all God. This has nothing to do with me. That choreographer, his name is Brooke Payne, right? He was a highly touted choreographer in our neighborhood. I named my daughter after yeah. Brooke, mm -hmm. right? And so they share the same birthday, wow. right? So it's, cra it's, it's crazy. Wow. And I just seeing them on Soul Train, but going out the house up to the park, and I see them at the park playing ball. I'm like, how y'all get up here so fast? Like, we ain't know it was tape delayed. Like, we just hood kids. We ain't know <laughs> nothing about that, man. And so... Um, Boston was a precious time, man, and, and so we kind of did everything. Like in the hood, you did everything. You played foot, whatever was in season, football, basketball, baseball. Um, we double dutch with the girls. We rap, we dance, we choreograph. We did every single thing because we were latchkey kids. We was outside all day, yeah. right? So in the midst of that, you're going to do what you did. And then like the, the moment that probably changed my life and made us migrate to... Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, because my mom is originally from, from North Carolina. She's from Dunn, North Carolina. And my grandmother was living in Raleigh. And my mom had to work the night shift. And for some reason, she just decided not to go because she didn't feel good. And her and my godmother would always go to work together and come home together. And my godmother went instead. And when she got off, a gang duct taped her to the bus stop and set on fire, right? She ended up living. But my mom was like, if that was me, I would have been there with her. Mm -hmm. So she was like, this is way too much. We're going to migrate down to Raleigh, North Carolina. And that's how we came down to Raleigh. We want to dig a little bit more deeper into that. We're right here center court at North Carolina Central University. We've got the coach of all coaches, Lavelle Moten, on the Broco Show. We'll be right back. Wow. Since I never had a shot, God threw me to alley hoop. I believe I can fly. Let me mingle with the angels. Heaven's in my parade. We'll be right back on the Bro Code Show after a brief word from our sponsors. We all we got. The Bro Code TV show was created to amplify the voices of others and share courageous stories of community leaders, organizations, and businesses that are doing great things. Every Wednesday night at 7 p.m., you can catch Bro Troy, Bro Kirk, and Bro Smith for another courageous conversation. You can find those conversations on our YouTube channel, at Broco TV Productions, and also our audio podcast channels, which are on Spotify, Anchor, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts at The Bro Code Show. Tap in to The Bro Code Experience. We all we got. Coming up next, superstar R&B creative, songstress, and lover of 90s R&B music, the one and only B. My Fiasco. From Texas to North Carolina, Hear her story of success. Tap in to the Bro Code experience. We all we got. Welcome back to the Bro Code Show. We are here on NC Central's campus with Lavelle Moten, uh, Coach. You told us a, a lot as far as the Boston story. Now you're in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. You know, walk us through what that experience was like a child. You know, there's probably a lot of influences around you, all sorts of sports and things that you're getting into. But how did basketball kind of get in your Jones? And when did it first hit that you could make this something mm -hmm. more than just a, a hobby? Yeah, I'm thankful. Uh, the crazy thing is, and the irony behind all that is, when we migrated to Raleigh, North Carolina, we migrated to Lane Street, shout out Lane Street. And as we're driving one day, we see a big field and I see a bunch of kids playing. I was like, mom, what's that? And it was the boys club. So she took me and my older brother, uh, shout out to my brother, Vern. Like she took us in and she asked like, can I sign my kids up? And I'll never forget, they said it's 750 a year. And she was like, I ain't got $750. They was like, no, it's $7.50. So she was like, oh, okay. So she signed us up. And the motto of the boys club back there was, it's the club that beats the streets, 
right? I never forget it had signs everywhere. It's the club that beats the streets. And my mom was a sheer genius in that aspect because she knew she had two boys in the projects that she had to raise with the inception, during the inception of crack cocaine and all, everything that came along with it. She's like, let me put these guys in this and occupy their time. And so it became a glorified babysitter for us. But we learned so many things at the boys club and obviously the sports. Anybody that, it's, it's ironic that we're sitting in a basketball gym because basketball is probably my third best sport. Everybody will tell you I was really good at baseball. I was a quarterback, so I was really good at football. And I was decent at basketball. Not great, I had to work at it. Baseball was natural, football was more natural. Had to work at basketball, but what kind of changed is girls like basketball. <laughs> so I like, yo, <laughs> girl, y'all like that. Football, you got on helmets. Nobody knows. You right, right? score a touchdown. They like, what's the number you again? Like, nah, you know, we did everything for the girls at that age. So I gravitated towards basketball, man. And um, I walked into, we all have that moment in our life that's a pivotal moment. Like, yo, this is the moment that changed your life. And I walked into the boys club one day, as I did every day. And I saw a big Pepsi truck. And I thought it was a truck that was just to, there to stock the vending machines. As I walk into the gym, I'm 10 years old. Everybody runs up to me and was like, yo, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do it. I'm like, do what? I see a bunch of Pepsi signs and banners and marketing and advertising around. There's like, yo, it's this thing called Pepsi Hot Shot. You got to do it, bro. And I was like, I'm not doing that. That's corny. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, and so my mentor, Ron Williams, come up and I got 10 year olds trying to explain to me the rules of it. I don't even know the rules. I don't even want to do it. And he just moved him out the way. He said, listen, man, you got a minute to shoot at six different spots. Each spot has a different point value. Just make as many shots as you can in a minute. I said, all right, say less. I didn't want to do it, and the, the CEO of Pepsi was there. He said, look, whoever wins, get two two-liter Pepsis over here. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, bro. Like, that's, all that's, all like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my first NIL <laughs> agreement right there, right? <laughs> so I do it. And I, I make most of my shots. And afterwards, everybody rushed the floor and like, pick me up. I'm like, yo, yo, you did it. You broke a record. And I'm like, man, damn, a record. Like, what's up with these Pepsi, man? <laughs> like, I need to take this back to the crib, right? And what I didn't know was that was the local competition. The following weekend, I had to do the city competition. I won that. The following weekend, I had to do the state competition in Charlotte. I won that. Now I got to go to the southeast region in Atlanta. And I'm like, I'm telling my mentor, Ron, and I'm telling my mom, like, I don't want to do this. No more. Like, it's, what am I getting out of this? Like, I'm bored with it. I didn't want to do it in the first place. I just did it for these two two-liter Pepsis. <laughs> now they want me to go to Atlanta. I don't know if y'all remember this, but this is around the time where black kids in Atlanta was being murdered mm. and missing. Right? It was like the Atlanta child murders. And I was like, no, nah, man, they ain't found <laughs> who killing them kids. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going down here. I was scared. And my, my mentor, Ron, said, look, I got him. We go down there, it's at Georgia Tech. Mm. Um, 5,000 people in the arena, like, it's, you know, it's the Southeast region. I'm like, yo, what in the world? It's my first time ever in a hotel. Mm. They put us at the wrist. I'm like, yo, what in the world is going on? So I get to the competition the next day, and it's like a 20-person competition, but it's one kid that's won it every single year. This dude got on Pepsi socks, Pepsi knee pads, Pepsi shorts. Like, he's sponsored by Pepsi. Like, nobody going to he got a red, white, and blue ball warming up. I was like, man, what y'all got me down here for, man? This kid going to win it. His daddy got a camcorder. This in the 80s. So yeah, I was like, yeah, he legit. He legit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Homie legit. You know what I'm saying? Ain't nobody beating him. He got camera crews following him and everything. I was like, man, nobody beating this kid. And so you get three rounds. And I did good my first two rounds and then slowly eliminated. So it came down to me and him. And... They said I needed like 49 points to beat him. The average was like 35, right? 35, 36. And so now I'm at half court um, in Georgia Tech. And I just remember looking up at God before they introduced you. I was like, man, just let me make my first shot. Because the first shot was the top of the key shot. So you would go from here to there. Mm -hmm. and that was worth five. I was like, if I make my first shot, it's over for home. I made my first shot. And then after that, it was just a blur. I ended with like 54 points. Mm. 
and everybody rushed me. They bought me the trophy. The kid was over there crying, and I just remember looking at him saying, if I would have lost, I wouldn't have felt like that mm. because he was really invested in mm. that. Yeah. Yeah. And this was a two, two liter Pepsi <laughs> thing for me. And I done hustled this and turned this. Like they would be happy for me on the block, the way I flipped this product mm. or whatever. So what I didn't know was now I go to D.C. Mm. and I'm shooting at halftime of the Bulls. In the, it was Bullets back then in the Bullets game. And so now they're sending me all my reservations, my flight info hotel. And I'm checking the mailbox and I get all the reservations and I'm throwing it away because I don't even want to go. So I'm hiding it from my mom so my mom don't see it. I don't even see the value. Just stupid. man. You know what I'm saying? And they finally called my mom and my mentor come to the house. He was like, yo, they've been sending reservations for Vail. And like my mom, like, we ain't got no reservations. And I was like, yeah, we ain't got no reservations. Man, I just do that stuff away, flight tickets, everything. And. She looking at me, and you know your mom can always tell when you lie. And I was like, she was like, hold on, you been? I said, mom, I don't know what you're talking about. She's like, boy, don't lie to me. So I said, I just don't want to go. So she said, oh, you going? I said, I'm not going. She said, oh, you going? So she said, Ron, come pick him up tomorrow. The flight is tomorrow. So we go to D.C. And as I'm flying, first time on a plane, I'm flying into D.C. It's my first time seeing everything that I've seen in the history book. Mm And it's my first time realizing that I'm finally out of the projects and it's because of my ability. Mm -hmm. So everything everyone has always told me that anybody from my place don't make it, now I'm proving that theory wrong right now. Mm -hmm. And it's because of me, it's because of my talent. I ain't hustling, ain't leeching off nobody, this is because of me. I get there, I go to the White House, I meet Ronald Reagan, um, see the Lincoln Memorial, like do all the tours. And then I go in and I win the competition. Next day I come back to school. I, I come back to school. I'm like a hero, bro. <laughs> and they throw me a parade in the hood. And it was the first time I realized my ability is not going to take me out. I know what I want to do in life. And I told my grandma, I said, I'm going to buy you this big house and this big car. And um, she said, I want you to understand something. She said, the two most important days of your life is the day that you were mm -hmm. born and the day you figure out why. She said, if you leave this earth and people remember you as a basketball player, you've done a poor job of living. I've never forgotten that in my life. You know what I'm saying? And so I tried to remember that and basketball has been so good to me, man. It's just taken me around the world. It's, it's fed my family, it's fed my community, it's fed my hood, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just because I was able to focus and shoot this basketball and so I'm proud of that, man, and um, I hope everyone else is, too. I know that's a long-winded answer, but... Nah, it was yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Nah, it was, it was yeah. good. I, I, so, you figure out your purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, you start getting all these records. You, you, you played at, at Central. Mm -hmm. I saw what had more wins than any other player mm -hmm. in Central mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. What was it like getting the call to come and coach for the place that you set records for? I'm going to give you something I never told anyone, man. Like, this is crazy. Um, again, let me give you the backstory. I always knew I wanted to be a great basketball player. And I think I've lived a life where I was so close to God and I had so many people that was praying for me that I really, like, and by too far, I'm not a perfect individual. You'll know that after five minutes. But you'll see y'all the Lane Street come out, right? <laughs> but I've always had a relationship with God where mm. when he talks to me or I talk to him, I get goosebumps and chills. And women call it their intuition. Mm. But men, we have it too. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if it's your gut instinct, whatever it is. But when you disobey this, mm. things just always go wrong. When you obey it, it goes right. And so when I went to Enloe High School, well, when I went to Daniels Middle School, I went to Enloe High School and I came here. The first day I got to all those spots, I did the same thing. I walked into the sports information director's office and said, who's the all-time leading scorer at this school, hmm. at this school and at that school? And Kyle Serber's over here, like, he will tell you, he's like, I said, because I already was familiar with Sam Jones, who was a Bostonian. And I knew he went here. I was like, how many, how many points did Sam Jones get? Because I got to go get that. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I knew if I could get that, then my name would be etched wherever it's going to mm-hmm. be if I caught him. And so I had a good playing career. And I said by the end of my playing career as, as all these places, my goal was to have my jersey retired at every place. Mm. Now that I'm a grown man, it manifested himself. Mm. And that's why I'm trying to tell people the power of will. This that's world right. teach you not to believe in yourself. Like, no, I'm going to believe in myself. But I only live one time. So I go overseas and play and professionally have a great career. But it's, it's a job and I'm, it's no more fun. Mm. Right. And so John Baker who was at my event, his father was the first black sheriff in Wake County. Mm. Him and Darrell Robinson, shout out to John Baker, Darrell Robinson, his son, Darrell Robinson's son, son is Shawan. We're at St. Aug in the summer league, and they was like, man, you gonna go back overseas? I was like, oh no, man, that grind, because I was over there 10 months, hmm. right? No internet, no nothing, so I'm coming back over here, bro, and I'm here for like a month, then I'm getting back on that plane going back, and I was like, I felt like a foreigner coming to America, not an American going to foreign territory. Yeah. So after a while, that kind of wears you out. No internet, no none of that stuff, right? And so Darrell says, there's an opening at West Millbrook Middle School if you're interested in coaching. And I only, he said, man, call this number. And I only did it because of respect for him. Mm-hmm. I wasn't interested in no coaching. I was like, man, I don't know if I'm going back overseas, but that coaching thing, you can have that. <laughs> I ain't interested in that. I was going to play till I'm 45, invest and retire. That was mm-hmm. my goal. So I call and I go to West Millbrook the next day and follow up. When I get to West Millbrook, the person that's interviewing me is my seventh grade teacher who was my favorite teacher of all time. I know I said, I'd be yeah, there. Yeah, like, yeah. this is... <laughs> Another divine moment. Oh, my <laughs> goodness, man. Like, it's just all... all my mm-hmm. whole life is divine. Mm-hmm. That, right? And so... I hug her because I ain't seen her in years. She, was, she knew she was my favorite teacher. Shout out to Miss Selden. I love her so much. And she says, Vel, um, I would love for you to come be the coach. And I said, let me think about it. She said, can you let me know by Friday? This is like on a Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. I said, yeah. The same week, my former coach that coached me here, Greg Jackson, he's not at Delaware State. He calls me the next day and says, I got to... Um, assistant job for eighty-five thousand dollars. If you want to come up here, mm. I said, "All right." He said, "Man, you gotta let me know something by Friday." So now I'm getting these two calls. So now I gotta go back and forth. So I called Miss Selden back. I said, "Well, how much does the West Millbrook job pay?" Ninety-five. You know it ain't eighty-five. Eighty-five hundred. She says two hundred and twenty-five dollars a month for three months. Oh. So that job, now I got to decide, do I want a $675 job or $85,000 job? 99.999% of the world would take the $85,000 job. Oh, yeah. I prayed about it, and I said, I'm going to take the $225 a month job for three months. Mm. And what I learned in that moment is when you're making a major decision in your life, if the first question you ask is what will other people think, then you're not living your life. You're performing for acceptance. Mm. And that's what the projects taught me. Stop performing for acceptance because they don't like you anyway, right. because they treat you, you're rock bottom. So when you're rock bottom, you get a full view while you're down there. You know who really loves you when you come from the projects, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> right? Because now it's glorified to be from there. Everybody want to create a story and act like they overcame something. But when I was there, it was like, nah. Yeah. Right. It was literally rock bottom. So I knew who loved me. I knew who didn't. Mm. And all of it was fine. But I had to become my own biggest cheerleader in Mm. the projects. I didn't need other people to confirm or validate who I was or cheer for me or validate any of that stuff. And So I took the job and I thought I was crazy. My mama thought I was crazy. I told my mama I took the job. She hung up on me. She was like, what? You stupid boy. Like, (laughs) but I was single at the time. And it was just something I did. We were able to win a championship in middle school. But two weeks later, she asked me to go in the classroom and teach. She's like, these kids love you. You need to go teach. I'm like, Miss Selden, like, you're my favorite teacher, but Lord, I can't go teach. Like, I don't know how to do this stuff, man. I know how to coach, but that's easy. But now you want me to go in the classroom and teach some kids? Like, no, bro. She's like, no, it's easy. You have a curriculum. And so I wasn't certified or qualified. So 
to overcompensate for what I didn't know, I just tried to show love to everybody. So all the kids loved me, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But they didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was just in the class. And so she was like, I was teaching language arts. She said, on this unit with Shakespeare, you don't have to do Shakespeare. I said, so I can do whatever I want, as long as I just follow this curriculum. She said, yeah, so I did Good Times. So I got a okay. bunch of kids that don't look like me and they're watching Good Times and I'm introduced. Yeah. This is like, okay, I see it, coach. It's the episode with Janet Jackson and Penny. That's oh, like, yeah. Janet Jackson. I was like, yeah. so I'm introducing yeah. them. So I got all their attention. Mm. Doing the poetry units, instead of haiku, limer limericks, and similes, we did spoken words. So we cut the lights off and I had candles in my room. Everybody <laughs> loved it. You know what we snapping? <laughs> I'm like, shh. You know what I'm saying? Like, we doing all that. We had little white kids, little Hispanic kids, little black kids. They just loved it, mm -hmm. and they gravitated. And so what I learned in that moment was to be creative. So mm -hmm. I had success on middle school. Now, another divine moment. I get bored with that because it's really not that much of a challenge. So my high school, there's a high school open at Sanderson High School, mm -hmm. and I get a call from Kathy Moore. Kathy Moore was my 10th grade, um, who's now the superintendent, mm -hmm. but she said, I want you to come apply for the job. It's 150 applications. She looks me dead in my face and says, and I flunked her French 2 class. This is the <laughs> craziest stuff ever. She looked me dead in my face and said, I'm going to hire you because ever since you was 15, there's always been something special about you. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Miss Moore, you know I had like a 60 in your class. Like, special. Like, you yeah. What special we talking yeah. about? Right? What special we talking about? <laughs> she give me the job. So Sanderson was a tough job. And we were able to win two championships in three mm -hmm. years. And we went to like the final four of the state, the furthest they've ever been. Now, North Carolina Central is calling me to go to your question. Mm -hmm. And what made Central call, and it really got hot around this time, I started training NBA basketball players as my mm -hmm. side hustle. And I'm still single at the time, so I think teaching and coaching is the best job on earth. Because I'm like, Summer's yo, off. I'm teaching from eight to one. Yeah. I got my summer <laughs> off, I got my basketball yeah. camp. And I'm training access. NBA, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah. what? Yeah. This is the best job ever. So I start training NBA basketball players and they see that article. And it's like, yo, we need you back here. And people don't know this, Carolina Central, no. I told him no three times. Miss mm. Moore calls me back into, it was the copier room. She called me in the copy room. I'm making copies. And she said, Lavelle, what's this I hear about you declining North Carolina Central? And again, it was the street thing. I was loyal to the people who gave me an opportunity. That was embedded in me. And I was like, I'm not leaving you for that. Like, you gave me an opportunity when nobody else did. Because prior to that, when mm -hmm. I applied for other high school jobs, Nightdale, Millbrook, um, Leesville, those schools told me thank you, but no thank you. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So they declined me. So nobody would give me a shot. Yeah. And she gave me a shot. So I said, I'm going to stay loyal to you. And I'm not going to just leave you high and dry. And she, I, I thank her so much. She took both of her hands, and y'all know any time a woman takes her hands mm. and put it on your face oh, like this, yeah. it's going to be a deep spiritual message <laughs> that's going to follow. Yeah. She, she's like, Lavelle, listen to me. And she made me feel like I was 10 years old. She <laughs> said, what you have to offer this world is greater mm. than Sanderson High School. Mm. You need to go back to your alma mater. And so that's when I got back on the phone with Bill Hayes, who was the athletic director at the time, and I said, I'll come back. So he's like, you sure? I was like, yeah. And so that's what allowed me to come back to North Carolina Central. I declined mm. that. So I couldn't see the vision beyond my present set of circumstances. I knew something was out there, but I didn't know. And it, every story that I tell you, I do the backstory so you'll know it's divine. And it's yeah. really just God saying this boy has been so crazy since he was a kid and needs so much special help. Let me take him and just walk him through because he'll mess it up. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I come back here for two years and um, they part ways with the coach that I'm under, um, Henry Dickinson. Now I'm like, here we go. I left a good thing to come up here and be a part. I'm pissed, mm -hmm. right? To come up here and be a part of it. I'm mad at the world. I was like, I told y'all I don't want this. Now me and my wife, we're still dating and we're closer now and we're engaged now. Um, so she was like, I called Miss Moore. 
I said, Miss Moore, I want to come back to Sanderson. You, st you still got a spot for me? <laughs> and I'm there. She was like, well, huh? I, was like, I want to come back to Sanderson. She was like, we'll, we'll talk later. And so my wife was like, won't you just have faith? She was like, why don't you go apply for the job? Now, we're coming off the worst year in men's basketball history. We're coming off the worst season in the country. I think we were like 3 and 30. Mm. Right? So I'm like, they're not going to hire anyone that they trying to get rid of everything moving. You know what I'm saying? Like, they don't want us to wear them jerseys no more. We were so bad, right? And so she said, well, you just have faith. So I just threw my name in the hat, and I made it to the next round. But I thought it was just charity, you know, like a token interview. There's like, yo, it's Lavelle, he, whatever. So we just going to have him on. Then I made it to the next round. And so as I'm sitting down with the interview committee, they asked me zero questions about basketball. They says, how, how will you be able to perform this job if you never recruited? Mm -hmm. And now I'm sitting in a room with 10 or 11 search committee members who got on suits and they're looking at me like with eyebrows like that. And I was like, well, I have, I have recruited. I said, when I was a kid, I went up to Lane Street. And I said, when, before we play pickup, I want you on my team, I want you on my team, and I want you on my team. Because if you lost, then you had to wait another hour to play again. Mm -hmm. I said, so that's technically recruiting, right? And they asked me, how will I run a basketball program? Because I've never ran a program. This is like being a CEO. How would I run it, um, a, you know, according to, like, this magnitude or whatever? And I was like... I run this program the same way my grandmother ran her house, with core values, um, with a belief system, with a moral system. We'll be truthful, we'll live it, we'll tell it, and we'll take it. And uh, that's what we'll do. And I kept giving them answers. They was like, well, what do you envision for this program? I said, "If you, now, now I'm just jumping out there. I was like, if you hire me, um, We'll win a MEAC championship in five years. We'll be the ACC school in five years. And we'll go to the NCAA tournament in the Sweet 16 in five years if you hire me. And now they're not even believing this because not only were we 3 and 30, the point differential was 40 points a game. That's how much we were losing by. That's the average. Like that guy out there, Kyle Serber, that's the sports information director. And that's the first thing I did. I said, what's the point differential on how much we're losing by? like 40 points a game. I was like, good Lord. <laughs> yeah. right. so I'm out here promising, promising these people a championship. So we, <laughs> yeah, we, we were losing by 40 points a game. But like, it was just that. Shout out to all the kids on that team, but we just wasn't a good team, right? right? Because they got caught up in the transition from D2 to, D, to Division One. It was just a whole nother world. Our first game was that dude, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was just a, a, a whole nother world, man. And I, that, those were my promises. And the last thing that I had to go through, the chancellor called me up to his office, Charlie Nams. And he never really looked at you. He always messed with his tie like this. And he said, I know you know basketball like the back of your hand. But he said, I want to know, are you tough enough? Hmm. They didn't really get what he was saying. You know, when they, when, when, as a man, when somebody right. asks you, are you tough enough, you think they're challenging your manhood. And I was like, I said, Chancellor, no disrespect. But um, my father walked out on me when I was four years old, bro, and never came back. I said, and I had to live with that. I said, Chancellor, no disrespect. Every day I walked out of my housing project, I had to make a life or death decision in order to get back in. I said, so if I ain't anything in this world, Chance, I'm tough. So he said, congratulations, you'll be my next coach at North Carolina Central Basketball. Mm. So the day I'm hired, the following day, I almost got fired because my AD said it was an unpopular decision, right? Some people loved it. Some people were like, this don't even make no sense. Now I'm the youngest coach in the country, coming off a 3-30 and 30 team or whatever it was, right? It just didn't make sense, mm. right? And I'm not even mad at those people. But my AD says, there's a lot of people who didn't feel like you were their guy. She said, I want you to call this number and I want you to go out to eat with them and prove to them that you the guy. 
And I said, no disrespect, I'm not doing that. Because the people that ask you to explain will never trust you anyway. Mm. And the people that trust you will never ask you to explain. Mm. Again, it's the project, it's the streets, Mm. right? And I was like, I'm not doing that. My grandma always told me, she was like, boy, they talked about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. What you think they're going to do about your little stinking? You know what I'm saying? So I was like, that's it. We're going to eat. We're going to pretend like we like each other. Then when I leave, they're going to say, see, I told They're going to find something. It's Mm -hmm. just what it is. And I'm not mad at it, but I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. I'd rather devote my time, energy, and effort into developing my team. And that's what it was. And again, I'm an avid reader. Um... I try to get inspiration from any and everything. And it was a 40 point discrepancy. But I don't know if y'all know this. Will Smith, his last year shooting The Fresh Prince, they offered him a million dollars an episode for 12 episodes and he turned it down. He said, no, I want to go to the big screen. And so his manager at the time was Benny Medina, who was really The Fresh Prince. Mm He asked Benny Medina to get him a list of the 10 highest grossing movies of all time. Benny Medina bought him the list. And Will said he just walked around and studied the list all summer. Then he said one day it just clicked that the 10 highest grossing movies of all time all were sci-fi. It had an animal in it. So he knew Mm. his first role or one of his first roles Mm-hmm. would be something with science fiction mm-hmm. had an animal because mm-hmm. the world gravitated and related to that. Mm-hmm. And that's why he selected Independence, Independence Day. That's right. And so when I went to Kyle after that 40-point thing, I said, give me the last 10 winners of the championships mm-hmm. in the MEAC. And I studied that list. I won't reveal on camera what I found because that's been our strategy ever since. But I got that from the Will Smith. Mm-hmm. I was like, yo, so I was like, yo, I got a plan. But I got to disregard this plan because this is what's consistently mm-hmm. in this league. So that looked good on paper in a little PowerPoint presentation, but that ain't going to get it. And so I gravitated to, I studied the last 10 previous winners, and that's how I came up with my philosophy strategically, man. Wow. I love that. We got the coach, the man, the myth, the legend. Giving a strategy, yeah. dropping <laughs> gems right here, center court, North Carolina Central University, Lavelle Moton, Broco Show. We'll be right back. Since I never had a shot, God threw me the alley hoop. I believe I can fly. Let me mingle with the angels. Heaven's in my peripheral. We'll be right back on the Bro Code Show after a brief word from our sponsors. We all we got. We always say that hope plus options equals success. When there's a lack of hope, oftentimes gravitate towards unfavorable decisions we can provide hope plus options, our children will ultimately be better. Uh, through love, consistency, opportunity, and exposure, that's how we really touch these kids. That's how we empower them, that's how we inspire them, and that's how we encourage them. And that's what we do well here at Wide Force. It's your boy, bro, Troy, a.k.a. Mr. Wine for a seat, and we are live right here on the corner of Hargett and Salisbury Street. Right behind us, we have the Lavelle Moat and Mural. We have the shooting guard, the current shooting guard at North Carolina Central University, Randy Miller. Randy, man, what does that mural mean to you, man, as a mentor of someone that's currently coaching you, man? What does that mean to you? Um, it's a blessing just to be here and see his mural. Um, it's, it's actually amazing um, the way it is. Um, but that just it just shows how how much of a leader and, and motivator Coach Moten is. Um, like I said, when I first came here, the first thing I remember him saying is like, "Who are you doing this for?" You know, who, like, "What does your last name mean? Who are you doing it for?" And I always think of that like, just just of him. You know, just not just yeah. telling you you can't be selfish. You know, you gotta you gotta find that reason who of who you doing it for because. He always tells us you're just doing it for yourself. I mean, you're not going to really go nowhere with that. So, yeah. I mean, it's just a blessing just to be under him and learning everything that he, that he does, you know. And we look forward to that championship, man. And yes, coming sir. to Central yes, sir. this April, man. No doubt. Appreciate man. you, man. Yes, you safe, bro. You too. Heaven's in my peripheral. I see it from an angle. We're 
We're back on the Bro Code Show. We done switched it up just a little bit. So we went from center court to right here in the locker room at the North Carolina Central University with my man, Lavelle Moten. What you got? So, Coach, you earlier you mentioned the word loyalty. Mm-hmm. And coming from the, the, the projects or the hood, the streets, whatever you want to call it, that's that's a that's an important uh, principle. Yeah. You've been at an HBCU since 1992. Mm. Before it was, you know, there's been a shift now, we know that, but you've been on campus for 20 some years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Speak to us a little bit about, because most coaches, man, we see them. Mm. They go from a mid major, I mean, Shaheen Sh- Sh- Holloway. Yeah. He just did it from, you yeah. know, St. Francis to, so, but you've been loyal to that. Mm-hmm. T- why? That's a great question, man. Um, because what this business, it's a great game, but a, but a terrible, a cruel business. Mm. And what this business has taught me is that there is no loyalty, right? That word is just like a, it's just a tattoo now, mm. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, it's, it's not that anymore. And um, I was always taught that that was one of the principles of manhood, mm-hmm. right? Integrity. You stand on what you, your word, you do what you said you were going to do. That don't necessarily mean you'll be any place forever because we're all entitled to um, seek other opportunities that's going to better ourselves and our families. But, you know, with the loyalty thing, man, I, I've always been, you know, that guy because it's in my DNA to do so, right? Because where I'm from, if you're disloyal, the results of that is death, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Like, and that's, that's as blunt as I can possibly put it. So you learn to be loyal to yourself, your family, your friends, your loved ones, and people that gave you an opportunity. Even when I came to North Carolina Central, um, after my first year, NC State called me and said they want me to come um, over there. And I declined. My sophomore year, my coach was contacted by A&T. He called me up in the office. He said, if I take this A&T job, are you coming with me? And I was like, mm-mm, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Nope. Mm-mm. Right, because I always thought big picture, man. I just wanted mm-hmm. to leave a legacy, mm-hmm. right? Nobody ever knew my name. My name won't respect it, right? I hated the first days of school because my teacher couldn't pronounce Lavelle, Low Moulton for some reason. Like, it seems like it's an easy name to pronounce now, but they tore my name up. Level, LaVar, Morton, Motown. Like, they just tore my name up. So I said, I just want to leave my name, mm. right? When I was on Lane Street, we had this cat call one time, and so he would always just come by and give you, like, a quote of the day, but you had to give him, you know, a dime, a quarter, something. Mm. And he asked me one day, he said, do you know your great-grandfather name? And I said, nah. He said, you don't know your great-grandfather's name? I said, nah. And he said, you know why you don't know him? And I was like, nah. He said, because he ain't leave you nothing. Mm. It jacked me up. I was like, oh, my goodness, you hit me with that? I was like a kid. I was 11, 12 years old. But what that taught me is that all these brands that we consider in the world, they're just last names. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jordan, that, Jordan is just a last name. Mm-hmm. Wells Fargo, that's just a last name, mm-hmm. right? Like Gucci, that's a last name, mm-hmm. right? And so I wanted my last name to mean something. So I was loyal more so to myself and my family and my commitment to myself. Because when I came here, I always said I wanted my jersey to end, you know, to hang up in those rafters one day so I could give my kids... Uh, enhancement in life, you know, a springboard to life or whatever, because now I know the quality of names. Like when you walk in to the Marriott, you always see a picture of J.W. Marriott. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? When you walk into the Hilton, you always see a picture of the Hiltons, right? But as black people, a lot of times our mama pull out our photograph or say, you remember uh, Annie May? You remember, my own hell is Annie May. I don't know no Annie May. Mm-hmm. Right? You don't even know because our families was divided and mm-hmm. You know, through slavery and throughout the years, we've been trying to play catch up and we've lost. And I was like, oh, I just, just, it's convoluted. So loyalty has always been a thing, you know, for me. And as it's transcended into the coaching world, you know, you get those phone calls every summer. Um, I probably had nine or ten, ten of those calls, had NBA opportunities. Um... I've turned down two jobs that would pay a million 
Mm-hmm. I had coaches that came and said, look, I want you to come be my associate. I'm going to give you a blank check. You write whatever you want in there. Mm-hmm. And all of those things are great, right? We all want to be elite in our profession. That's why we work and bust our butt every day. But, you know, it goes back to that. You know when you know, and you got to trust your instinct and your gut, mm. right? And you got to play the long-term game. And, you know, I've been loyal to North Carolina Central, and um, they gave me an opportunity. And I'm always grateful for that. Now, I do feel like I've, I've given them <laughs> a return on the investment. Yeah. Um, and that's the business of it, you know. And hopefully they can be loyal to me. You know, the same. Because when you're loyal, you just expect that mm-hmm. to be reciprocated. I think the pain comes when it's not reciprocated by one party, whether that's a relationship or marriage or a business deal. That's when the grounds get broken of loyalty. But I'm always going to be loyal, man, because it's who I am and it's in my DNA and my mom and my grandmother. And, you know, just the streets kind of instilled that into me. I love that. We're in the locker room before I kick it back to you. I'm looking at the wall coach and it says anything your name is attached to must be great. Must be I great. love that, man. What you yeah. got? So shooting back to your, your, your park, you have a park. Like I, I grew up playing in the Chrome Park. Mm-hmm. I don't know who the Chrome is. Right. And I see your sign <laughs> right. in the mural mm-hmm. and I'm just sitting there and I see your family and you're, the respect. Mm-hmm. It really goes into what you're talking about and you couldn't have got that without being loyal. But I, I would love to talk about the HBCU. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw the other day, uh, Nate McMillan, you posted yeah, mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So talking about standing on people's shoulders mm-hmm. or even side by side, man. Right. You talked about all the people so far that have been kind of with you and mm-hmm. guided you in your vision. How important is that? And who are those people in your life other than a Nate McMillan, for instance? Because there's so many amazing people in yeah. Raleigh, Durham, in this area. Yeah. yeah. It was so many people, <clears throat> man, for me. Um, I was truly the product of that African proverb, it takes a village. Mm. And I don't ever write speeches or whatever when I go talk to corporations, I just get up there and talk. I do commencement speech, I just talk, right? Um, But I needed a speech at the park dedication because it was specifically gonna thank every single person that I could see, right? I just want, I didn't want it to be about me, I wanted it all to be about them. I was going I, I thank the frozen cup lady, Felicia Thorpe, because I know you got tired of me knocking on your door at six o'clock, you know, and, and giving you a quarter for a frozen cup. And she was like, what, what flavor, Puffy? And I like red. You know what I'm saying? Red, red was our flavor. flavor. Yeah. That's a flavor to it. Yeah. Get, get that red. You know? And so all of those people were super important to me, man. Um, you know, there was ladies that made me sandwiches and sold fish plates so I could fund my AU projects mm-hmm. and, and like that get forgotten. You know what I'm saying? And so you move on and now they see you on TV and they don't get to talk to you as much and you're just a human being so you mm-hmm. can't go back and talk to every single person every single day. But that was a golden opportunity for me to let them know exactly what they meant in my life. And it was really, really emotional for me, especially for my childhood friends because yeah, we went through so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like that was mm-hmm. I can't even I couldn't even say on camera. Like because there was so many cameras over here and I'm looking at them and I'm like, but I'm looking at one guy. I don't even want to say his name. But right there in that park, somebody was playing dice and somebody came in and robbed the dice game. And he was just a victim of circumstance. He was dead, they made him lay down. And the guy that robbed him Park tried to kill everybody there, but the gun jammed. Mm. And he ran out the gate and they was chasing him and they were shooting at him while they was chasing him. And then he ran into my homeboy's house and just kicked the door in. Like he was just like, what? So can you imagine us sitting here and somebody just come kick the door in? What? Like, what in the world? So I'm, I'm getting emotion because I'm looking at him like, homie, you don't even supposed to be here. But mm-hmm. he got his little cell phone recording the moment, mm-hmm. right? And so you have, we talk about mental health. One of the things that always bothered me and caused me anxiety was survivor's remorse. Mm. Because I ask God all the time, like, yo, why me? Mm-hmm. I want the best basketball player that came from there. 
I want the smartest kid. I want the most brilliant mind that came from Lane Street. And I always say my first education in life was LSU, Lane Street University, mm-hmm. because it taught me things that I carry with. I, I live more by the code of Lane Street than I do. I got two degrees from Central, and that's great, but nobody's ever asked me to square root of nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, they didn't ask you to square up. No, right? they didn't ask you to square yeah, up, right. though. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And just the Pythagorean theory, all this stuff mm-hmm. is good, but the ultimate education in life is finding out who you are, right? We go to learn about everything else and date theories and what Einstein thought and what Richter thought and what the Pythagorean theory was. That's mm-hmm. cool, but we're learning what they thought. Who are you? That's the ultimate question. Like, who are you? And so many people go through life and they can't answer that question. And every day we're challenged on that, right? Mm-hmm. Where we wake up and we've been programmed as individuals and we don't even know it. The first thing we do when we get out, before we even get out of bed, some people don't even thank God in the morning. Mm-hmm. First thing they do is grab their phone mm-hmm. to see. And I always say, you're so interested and worried about what someone else is thinking about you, whether it's mm-hmm. a text message, mm-hmm. whether it's your notifications, whether it's your Instagram, Facebook, or mm-hmm. uh, Twitter, whatever it is, you're looking at your phone. You don't even know if your legs work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You don't even know if you can get out of bed. You ain't even put your legs on the ground, but that's what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And so we've programmed ourselves to kind of fake care mm-hmm. about things. Like, so our culture now is fake caring about things, and I'm like... What are we doing? Social media is great in a lot of ways because it helps you connect with people. But it has its curses as well because, Mm -hmm. again, we're we're so much searching for the validation and confirmation of of other people. I saw saw a lady um, celebrating the death of Kevin Samuels the other day. Mm -hmm. And however you feel about him, that's, that's whatever, right? And like she was blatant about celebrating the death of someone, and mm-hmm. inside I'm like, yo, is that where we got to? Mm-hmm. That's right. That we we celebrate like, mm-hmm. who raised y'all mm-hmm. to sell? Like, what are we doing? Mm-hmm. You follow what I'm saying? And I said that's cool. A couple of days later, the same lady puts on um, social media when Kendrick Lamar album dropped. She says. Uh, Kendrick is too woke for me. This this album too uplifting and empowering for me. I need something else to turn up to. Hold on. So you celebrating a man, regardless of how you feel, I don't care. Mm-hmm. But don't you can't celebrate the death of a man that you said degraded you. Mm-hmm. But now you're throwing stones at the guy that's trying to uplift and empower. What sure. do you want? Mm-hmm. So I think it's put us in a place of we don't even know who we are as individuals anymore, and that's the danger. Of everything, because if we can't teach, if, if we don't know who we are, how are we gonna teach some kids something or tell them about something? Because these kids ain't trying to hear that. Like you walking in trying to tell a kid, yo, keep your head on straight. And that. Man, they, they, they kids. I'm out there in the streets with them kids. They don't care nothing about it. If they mm-hmm. can't see anything tangible associated with you that you're telling them, and they're like, okay, but what you got? What are, what can you do for me? What is this? What is that? And David Banner, he told me, man, he's like, bro, you can't lead the people unless you can feed the people. Mm. So I stopped trying to talk people to death. And I just said, I'm going to get programs where I'm going to feed these people. Where it's really, Because let's be honest, 99% of our problems in the black community come from lack of economic mm. <laughs> access. Ex- right? Yeah. And so we have to put our people in positions to do that. So all these great and valuable relationships that I have. And I know I'm just going left field. I don't even got your question. That's my ADD kicking in now. That's all my ADD kicking in now. Like, all of it is, how can I take this relationship that I had with Google, Amazon, Red Hat, and mm-hmm. First Robotics, and mm-hmm. whatever, whatever, and leverage, yeah. and leverage that relationship mm-hmm. for the betterment of my community? That's Not right. necessarily me, because I've learned in life, the more you get, the more people want to give you for some odd reason. Mm-hmm. Like, me and my, like me and my family, we go out to eat, and nine times out of ten, when we're done with our meal, the way to come out and say, um, Moten family, this is a complimentary meal on behalf of our restaurant and the manager. So, yeah, where, so was, the, where was y'all at when I needed right, this? Yeah. I, I can't, 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 I
<laughs> what was y'all like? Yeah, my man, I was yeah. stealing honey buns out. Bro, yeah. I needed y'all. Yeah. It's because yeah. I, was, I was starving. You see yeah. what I'm saying? But I was yeah. like, yo, the more you get, they give, they give stuff to people that really don't need it. So mm-hmm. I just try to take everything in those situations and leverage it back to the community. I understand what comes along with that too, mm-hmm. right? Because I tell people all the time, like, just because I'm doing something in the community doesn't mean I won't get the hate <laughs> or yeah. well, you, you the dislike. You follow what I'm you saying? And I'm... I'm cut for that. Why? Yeah. Because I done studied the history. Mm-hmm. I, I know what it is. I mm-hmm. know what happened. Mm-hmm. I know Malcolm died with 200 pounds. And I ain't, by far, please, I ain't no Malcolm or nobody. Right? <laughs> I'm just doing the veil kid. But I know, I know what they did to Jesus. Mm-hmm. The same people that cheered for him mm-hmm. are the same people that crucified him. Mm-hmm. I know what they did to Malcolm. Mm-hmm. Right? I know Harry Belafonte had to fund Martin Luther King's um, walks and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. Like, so if we really cared about those people like we say we do, why does any sibling associated with Martin Luther King have to ever pay a dime for anything, mm-hmm. right? Because that man sacrificed his life literally for everyone else. So I know, and I tell people this all the time about their community and work, when you do it, you better do it for the people because right. if you're doing it to be liked and so on and so forth, it ain't going to work because you're going to get the criticism. That's what come along with it. I never take it personal mm-hmm. if at all it does happen, right? Because I know where it comes from. I always say anybody that don't like me don't like themselves because they ain't done nothing to nobody. They don't, they don't know you. Right. You don't can't, know me. Can't know you. Ain't done nothing to nobody. Yeah. My Care <clears throat> Foundation, it touches you directly or somebody in your family Indirectly. Mm-hmm. It, it's going to touch you, your mom, your cousin, your auntie, your uncle, your nephew, your grandchildren, or your grandkids. It's going to, t- it, it's, it's that broad that it touches and helps someone. So how can you be mad at that person that does that? You're not mad at me. I understand if you do get upset, I understand where it comes from. Yeah. And it's never personal. And I had this conversation with Pooby mm-hmm. Chapman, mm-hmm. and I was telling him, don't mistakes. The love that you get in the streets for the streets loving you because the streets don't love nobody. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Like they don't love nobody. It's just what it is. I said, but bro, don't do what you do for validation of other people for them to pat you on the back. You do what you do out of the love for it, right? Because, mm-hmm. and this is how it comes. And a lot of people be like, man, I'm getting some hate and I don't even know where that came from. So here's where it comes from. Um, Let's say there was another young, young, young man that I grew up with or someone grew up with and he too was growing up without a father and he was trying to fill that void. He, all he ever wanted to hear was his mother say, I'm proud of you, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, but she was too busy working to try to put food on the table to really you know, be that sensitive towards a grown man or whatever, whatever. So now he, he becomes a grown man they're in their family room one day, and I'm just giving you a scenario. They're watching TV, and all of a sudden, I pop on the TV. And the mom says, look at Puffy. I always knew he was going to be a fine young man. I'm so proud of him. <laughs> now, he's sitting there listening to that. Mm-hmm. She just said about me what, she, what he always wanted her to say about him. Mm-hmm. So now it's like, I can't st- inside, he's like, I can't stand him. Right. But it ain't got nothing to do with me. It just got something to do with the fact that his mom never echoed those words to him. Mm. Right. So you kind of hate that aspect of it. And that's what circulates in the hood. That's the mentality of the hood. And that's what we got to fix. You know what I'm saying? We want to talk more about that, too, especially uh, the relationship, special relationship that you have with your grandmother. Yeah. When you talked about the mural and the people that you put on there. Um, but we're right here in the locker room with Lavelle Moten at North Carolina Central University with the Bro Code. We'll be right back. Since I never had a shot, God threw me to Ali Hoop. I believe I can fly. Let me mingle with the angels. Heaven's in my peripheral. I see it from my angle. This is Avery Proctor here with the Proctor Report and the Bro Code. So 
I am here at North Carolina Central University, my alma mater, here with Avail Moten. How are you doing? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm great. It's amazing <laughs> to be here and to be interviewing you. Thank you so much. A fellow much. eagle to a fellow eagle. High five to Yes. That. Okay. We look, we soaring real high. No okay. Look, this is, what, <laughs> this is what James E. Shepard said when he, when, what he wanted for Central. So it's amazing Absolutely. to interview you today. Thank and, you so much. Um, you know, being here, being a part of the Broco, this is amazing. When it comes to you coming back to Central and playing here and coming back as a coach, mm -hmm. how was that transition for you? Um, it was easy for me. I think it was difficult for everyone else mm -hmm. because, you know, the thing about attending this university and people knowing you when you're 17 yeah. years old, right? when you come back as a grown man, they still treat you like mm -hmm. you're 17, 17 years old, yep. right? And so yep. that was the difficult part about it. And when I came back, I didn't have a, a huge portfolio. I didn't have a long resume. Mm -hmm. So throughout, even though I had success as a player, people really didn't buy into this coach. whole coaching thing. Mm -hmm. I was the youngest coach in the country and I was just fortunate that, wow. you know, um, my administration gave me an opportunity to become a coach. So right now it's more popular. <laughs> <laughs> uh, than it was 12, 13 right. years ago. Right. But I'm grateful for the opportunity. It's amazing. It's amazing yeah. to come back and see how much you know it's grown and how much you've done for the university. Thank you. So how do you manage family life and dealing with players and they have their issues, they got their mental health, you know, they got their family issues, mental health issues, and then how do you take that head off and say, I'm, I'm husband, I'm dad? You know, I, I, I'll be completely honest with you. It's, a, it's an everyday, I don't want to say battle, but challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, I grew up without a father, so yeah. I tried to become the father that he wasn't to me. And it right. was actually the best thing in terms of me having a blueprint right. and a template for a father because he wasn't there. So right. I just decided to be the opposite yeah. of everything yep. that he was. Yes. And I understand what it's like to resent a father. I know right. what it's like to have that void and carry that pain and Definitely. going in, in the corner and cry and just right. wish for that. Right. Because for so many years, I felt like I wasn't good enough. Right. Um, because if the man that created me Ain't didn't him. love me enough exactly. to stay, then, you know, well, who is? So that right. kind of affected my relationships that I encountered along the way, whether yeah. it was romantically or from right. a coach's standpoint or from a friendship standpoint. I just really didn't trust. And so yeah. as a coach, you look in the mirror and you face the harsh reality to say, well, I spend more time with other people's kids than I do my own. Mm. And that's a gut punch. Yeah. I'm fortunate that I have an amazing wife that's who um, understands me, right. understands the job and right. everything that's associated with it. But I'm also fortunate to have amazing kids right. who understand. Right. right. And so they don't really care about the worldly possessions and the superficial right. things. They right. just care about the time. So I learned to focus on quality time right. over quantity of time. Yes. And so when we when we're together, we do it big, like we, so I take them on vacations and just have me time with yeah. just them. Um, when I come back, my daughter and I, we have daddy-daughter date Good. date week and That's things good. of that. So because I want to plant seeds so she can always remember and never be able to say, my okay. daddy spent more exactly. time with everyone else than right. with me. I love it, yeah. I love it. And, and daddy-daughter time is very important. Me growing up without my parents and being in foster care, you really learn so much because of that void. Yeah. So I understand yeah. when you said, you know, because I didn't have that, I knew what to do. Mm -hmm. I the same thing with me with my kids. Same, I'm like, look, because I didn't have this, this is what I know I need to do. I need yeah. to show up. Yeah. And Absolutely. you show up for your team and mm -hmm. you showing up for your family. And that's mm -hmm. amazing as a black man. Thank you. And you know, we don't Thank see you enough so of it, you know. Yeah. So it is it is amazing seeing you being recognized, you know, getting your part, mm -hmm. coming back to Raleigh, you know, mm -hmm. that's amazing. And um, you know, what would you say to your younger self? Ooh, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, everything's gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. um, as simple as that was, I didn't think that. Yep. You know, I grew up in the era where I didn't know if I was gonna make it to be 21 years old. Right. Um, someone told us when we were kids that, you know, one out of three of y'all. Right ain't gonna be here, right. right? So now I look up, it was nine of us. Wow. At my park dedication, it's only six of us. Right. So a third of us is no longer here. Right. And that saddens me right. um, to the point that I'm just extremely blessed and I, right. I thank God every day I wake up right. for the opportunity. Definitely. But for my younger self, I would just tell myself like everything is gonna be okay because I spent so much, so many nights laying my head down. Right. Um, 
having insomnia, yeah. creating more anxiety and stress because mm -hmm. I was worried about walking out of my door and being right. able to come back in. A right. lot of people don't know, like when you grow up in the projects, yep. each day you walk out, it's, you gotta make a life or death decision just to get back in. Right. Then I'm worrying about my mother, right? <laughs> right? right. And her mental and right. her anxiety. I don't know, like I was watching um, Good Times and it was when James had died, okay. right? And Good Times was like my favorite show. Okay. And I just remember watching Florida Evans, his wife, just pretend everything was okay the mm -hmm. whole episode. And then she just broke. And now it's become a meme when she said, damn, damn, damn. Mm -hmm. But I felt that right. because when my grandmother passed, that was my mom. And I saw my mom break. Right. And you ain't have, I ain't have no man in the house. I right. just had an older brother that right. was five years older. So I'm dealing with the fact my father not dead. She's dealing with the fact that her man is not dead. Now right. she's dealing with the fact that the pillar of our family is gone. So right. there's so much growing up. And right. I just didn't think it was going to be okay. So if I had to tell myself, my younger self, anything, it would be everything is going to be all right. And it is, and you've, you've definitely broke down those barriers. I mean, you've done amazing work here at Central. Thank and it's amazing so as an alumni to come back and just see it. It's just amazing. So shout out to you. Shout out to North Carolina Central University, one of the <laughs> best HBCUs out there, okay? You know it. Y'all better you know get it. at it. Always. This is Avery Proctor here with the Proctor Report and Lavelle Moe. We're back on the Bro Coach Show. We've got the coach, Lavelle Moten, right here at North Carolina Central University. Lavelle, we know that earlier we talked about your grandmother being a huge pillar in your life. Mm -hmm. One, two words that uh, we saw in another podcast. No, the TED Talk that you did mm -hmm. was love and faith and really talking about that relationship that you had with her. I'm curious, you know, as grandma's baby, you grandma's baby as well, what's right. that piece of wisdom that stuck with you? And then last but not least, there's to kind of marry that and maybe it, maybe it kind of coincides, there's four cornerstones that uh, are four words that are on the wall before you come in this locker room. One of them is brotherhood, mm -hmm. family, mm -hmm. trust, mm -hmm. and love. Tell us more about that. Um, the first part um, with my grandmother, the sound advice, man, she, you know, it goes back to the two most important days of your life is the day that you were born and the day you figure out why. Mm -hmm. And, um, like on April 1st, 1984, that was the day that Marvin Gaye got shot. In the hood, that was a big thing, right? My mom made me run to my grandmother's house and tell her. It was two blocks over. Um, and when I told my grandmother, she turned on the TV. And as I turned on the TV, they was having a moment of silence for him. And I'll never forget, they flashed his birthday, April 2nd, 1939, through April 1st, 1984. And she said, the birthday don't matter. The death day don't matter. The only thing that matters mm. is that dash. Mm -hmm. She said, because that's how people will remember you and that's the profound impact that you have while you're here. So don't worry what other people say about you. Just worry about the, how they're gonna remember you. And so that's what I'll always remember from my grandma, just that dash. And every day we wake up, we get another opportunity to add to our dash. Mm. At my funeral, they're not gonna talk about no championships and all. like. No one cares, right? When you, whatever you believe, when you, when you get to that gate and God is there and you got to sell him on why you need to get in, I'm going to mention my championships, but I don't think he cares. I'm like, God, you remember we won it? How are you? Yeah, you, you remember, like, we won it back to back, too. Like, we won, I don't think he going to care. All he's going to care is about the impact that you had on other people. Mm -hmm. So I always try to stay humble in, um, in my belief in that. And with the core values and the, and the systems and the words that you mentioned, you know, the brotherhood, the family, and the, and the trust, I always think truth builds trust, mm -hmm. right? Everybody wants someone to trust them or whatever, but just, just be truthful. Be truthful with yourself, be truthful with them, and that's what it's about. And so I just bought my grandmother's home into a big, <laughs> Uh, university and we just remained on those core values and, and tried to abide by those things and not overcomplicate it right I I go speak at these fortune 500 companies man and the first thing I tell them is like 
Yo, here's our mission statement at North Carolina Central. And it's really simple and juvenile. But basketball is a game. Games are meant to be fun. Ain't no fun losing, so you might as well win. That's our mission statement, right? I said, man, I walk into y'all Fortune 500 companies and y'all got a mission statement that's three paragraphs long. <laughs> I said, so even the person that wrote the mission statement don't know the mm -hmm. mission statement. So mm -hmm. how can you ask people to buy in to this company mm -hmm. and nobody knows the mission statement? So I asked them, I said, what's the mission statement? I said, can you raise your hand? I'm calling on you. It'll be 300 people in there and nobody raised their hand. Yeah. That's a problem within your culture. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? And I tell them, like, yo, just keep it simple. Just be mm -hmm. good to people. I was like, the number one fast food restaurant in America mm -hmm. is Chick-fil-A. Two right? words. Right? Mm -hmm. And I said, it's real crazy when you think about it because mm -hmm. they're only open six days a week. That's right. They have less restaurants than McDonald's and all these other restaurants. But, and, they, and you know, whatever you choose and feel... That's, that's your preference. But they don't really have the best of nothing, mm. right? I think Bojangles had the best chicken tenders <laughs> and fries with that season on them, man. You dip that yeah. in honey mustard. Yeah. But oh, yeah. not the honey mustard. Yes. Boy, that's a devil, <laughs> right? But you don't know when you're going to get that. Yeah. Because I pulled up to Bojangles that's right. drive through, and I had to say, hello, y'all in that shit? Like, yeah, welcome to Bojangles. May I help you? Like, good Lord. <laughs> and then don't ask for a straw. Oh, or don't man. ask for you uh, forgot my honey mustard. Like yeah. you ain't no telling what may come along with that. But when you pull up the Chick Fil A, it's hi, welcome to Chick Fil A. It's ninety four degrees outside today. I hope you're having a hot, steamy day. Da 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 da. How may we help you? So you like what? I order French fries. They give you mayonnaise and every other condiment in the mm -hmm. bag, right? Mm -hmm. And the last thing they always say, "Thank you for coming to Chick Fil A. Please come again." Mm -hmm. And so you pull up to a Chick-fil-A parking lot with 30 cars wrapped mm -hmm. around it before mm -hmm. you pull up to a McDonald's or Bojangles That's restaurant right. with two or three cars. Why? Because of the service. That's right. And they treat you so well that the food, they treat you so well that the food even tastes a little better. And a little better. You follow what I'm saying? That's right. And that's what life is. And I tell these Fortune 500 companies, y'all had to pay me to come in here for this? Like, I'm going to cash your check. You ain't getting that back. But... <laughs> You should know this. Mm. And so my thing is, don't complicate things, man. Like, it's just keep it really simple. And that's what my grandma did. She lived in a simple, modest project. And we just had core values to go off of. And we lived by that. And that's, that's who I am as a man. And I just think people need to adopt those street principles and apply to their life, their homes, and their families. And the world would be a much better place if we did Keep it simple. Yeah, that was one of the, the core principles I had early on. I love it. Well, Coach, we've asked you a whole lot of questions. Yeah. We appreciate you. But we have another segment called Flip the Script. Yes, sir. And in this segment, you get a chance to be the host and ask yeah. us questions. Now, you can ask us individually or collectively. Well, I'm going to ask, and I, I want, it's the same question for everyone, right? And I, I kind of related to it earlier um, with me and the Pepsi hot shot because I, I call it the light bulb moment or that defining moment in your life or career that kind of puts you over that speed, speed bump and propels you into life. So mm. I'm interested in knowing what was your light bulb moment in your life? We always start at the end, so yeah. we don't put you on the spot. <laughs> no, we start at the end. What was the light bulb moment in your life where it went off, where you knew this is who I am, this is what I want to do, I have a understanding of perspective now, right, about my life. I think that's the most critical thing for man and especially black men. Yeah. So at 19, I had my first son, mm. but I was still in the streets and that hadn't really, that didn't change me at that moment. Mm -hmm. It took a little while longer, but I remember being in the car at, at the corner store with my homies and we was doing wrong things. and. It was my turn to go in the store. Mm. I didn't want to go in. So we were arguing back and forth. Eventually, I went in. Mm -hmm. When I came back out, they were all getting arrested. So if I didn't go in, so they went to prison. I didn't go to prison. And it was in that moment. And I had a, and I had a praying grandmother, too. Mm. And you said earlier, I didn't know why, but that's why. Yeah. And I knew it. Wow. I had, I had a different know. level of coverage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was in that moment, I was like, wait a minute. I'm supposed to. And she had been telling me like yeah. different ways, but she wasn't heavy with it. And she knew I was in the streets doing stuff I shouldn't be doing because I live with her. But it was in that moment that it kind of went off. And I was like, yo, you, you bigger than this. You better than yeah. this. Your last name 
better than this because I was like out there and my family could see me. Right. And I was like, no, no, I can't do this. And yeah. that really, is, it started there. There you me. go. Yeah. That's yeah. beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, for me, I'd, I'd go back to 2016, you know, I was dealing with a lot, divorce, change the job, and I, I decided to do a mission trip uh, to South Africa, mm. Cape Town, uh, to help with a uh, vacation Bible school type mm. thing. First time I ever gone to that length to do a, a, a mission trip of any mm. sort. And um, walking in and seeing the children living in, you know, a room no bigger than this at mm. 30 kids. Mm. But they're happy. Like mm -hmm. every day that, that we we started the day off, they were just happy to mm -hmm. see us. You know, even mm -hmm. though you would think that they would have every reason not to be. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that gave me you know more of a foundation to say, you know, you need to keep staying involved in a child's life, whether it's here domestically. I don't have kids of my own, so right. I, I I try to pour a lot into uh, the, the children that we serve. Though that that helped cement the fact that I need to keep doing this, whether it's big time stages, little stages, stay involved in the life of children. Right. Yeah. You know, the work that you do with uh, Lavelle Cares hits a little different for us, you know, similar to what he just spoke of, mm -hmm. uh, because back in 2017, we decided to take life's purpose by the horns and start a nonprofit called YM4C. Um, mm -hmm. YM4C helps with life skills, character-based education, physical activity. I always said I wanted it to be a hybrid of the Boys and Girls Club and YMCA. Mm -hmm. uh, really figuring out that whomsoever will let them come mentality. Um, I, that came by way of having to fix situations in my own home where my son was dealing with bullying and being called everything you could think of at Daniels Middle School. Oh, uh, and uh, so when you said it, I was like, wow. You know, I don't believe in coincidence either, but yeah. uh, I solved or helped to solve a situation um, that was a small piece of a bigger puzzle at a lunch table with chicken tenders from Bojangles. Because the kids that I came to the table with, I asked them and they all said Bojangles, so that's what I brought back. Uh, and it was in that moment I said, man, uh, I, not only did I solve that for my, my son, but there were other children too that were impacted by that when mm -hmm. I came there for him. Right. I didn't know who the right. kids right. were. They didn't know who I were, but right. I saw the residue. And when I saw the residue, I said, man, this, there's, there's more to this. Uh, and I just started to put, stoke more fuel on the fire. And here we are five years later, you know, a vendor for Wake County Public School System, have served on every level from K all the way through collegiate level in the private and um, faith-based communities. Mm -hmm. man. And mm -hmm. uh, it just speaks volume. I've, I understand why I'm here. Right. Purpose. So I, I, I understand. I'm I'm living in my dash right right now. That's beautiful. Man. And what and I I ask y'all that because normally when you ask someone that, two things happen: either they identify their purpose mm -hmm. or they identify their perspective, right? And what Lane Street taught me was that life is about perspective. Mm -hmm. It ain't what you see; it's how you see it. Mm -hmm. And and what you see is what you get. That's it. You know what I'm saying? That's so that it. goes to the Cape Town. Like these kids, you think like, nah, we're not unhappy. They happy, right? They just, it's the little things, man. It's the little things. I love it. Coach, we did some research. Yes, sir. You know, you, you're intentional about what you post on social media, which we all should be, right? Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, 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 yeah. We found some that. pictures, man. We said pictures worth a thousand words. Now, we don't need a thousand, Coach, yeah, but we yeah, want to hear why yeah. you shared it, who's in it, and why it was important to you. Okay. Let's start with that one. Wow. Um... My big brother, Nate McMillan, and my little brother, P.J. Tucker, we all went to Enloe to carry out the history, and we were all honored and had our jerseys retired on the same night. So that, that picture right there is worth a thousand words. Yeah, right there. yeah indeed. No about indeed. It. Tell us about this one. I know this one hits a little different, man. Yeah, man. That's, that's, that's Junior, Vail Junior. And so he's leading us out on the floor. He's been doing that since he was three years old, man. Mm -hmm. And so I just want him when he's older to say my daddy loved me enough to have me present at all times yeah and last but not least man talk to me about this one right here man david banner one of the we were we were introduced uh years ago through ninth wonder ninth wonder introduced us and uh me and him just hit it off man like we just became close friends and you know he mental health mm. um activist like 
He's an incredible spirit, incredible mind, always yeah. honest with you. That's my brother right there, man. Love him. I love it. I love it. Coach, before the episode, you know, and, and, and this has um, been resonating through this whole episode, that words matter. And we mm-hmm. asked you, hey, what is one word that you use to describe mm-hmm. yourself mm-hmm. or that you use in times of toughness? Right. And you said warrior. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we want to do something special for you. So we, we always pass on the $2 bill. It's not a lot of money. But it's what's no, written on it that matters, good. right? <laughs> He's like, wait a minute, two dollars. <laughs> um, we wrote on the back the Bro Code Show. We signed it for you. We wrote, "You matter," because you're making an impact, you, and, and it's one that's a ripple effect in the community. You mentioned the word tangible. It's tangible for people. Uh, we got Lavelle on here, and we got Warrior on here, man. So we really appreciate the man you are and what you're doing for the community. Um, and like this two dollar bill, you too are unique and rare. So Thank you know, you, I know man. you got plenty of awards, but maybe that can make it to the no, show. I don't know. Who is it? I'm gonna, I'm gonna frame it. I might spin it the way that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's hot. It's hot. Four dollars. Yeah, that extra, I might get this. But no, nah, I definitely appreciate this. No man. doubt. Last but not least, coach, we got one last segment. Mm-hmm. And first and foremost, man, have you enjoyed the bro code experience? I love it, man. I love it. You okay, know, like okay. I, I, it's. I'll be honest, man, like, you know, we do interviews a hundred a week and, you know, so you ain't always jumping at the opportunity to do them right? Right. because it's, again, people pulling and then you get all these emails on everyone else want to interview you. Man, I got a podcast. He got a podcast. Everybody got podcasts. And so you start spinning in circles, man, and you just it takes away from who you are, it's, you know, sometimes. But. I like these kind of interviews because it's real, it's pure, it's authentic, right? And it's, it's shared values. You mm-hmm. guys understand what I'm talking about. I don't have to translate it and go into full detail. I can talk in codes, I can talk in slang. I, you get it, yeah. right? And that's the beauty of it. So it, there's a level of comfort that's not necessarily there with any and everyone else who just want to sit down and provide an interview. So I'm loving it, man. You heard it right here on the like, road, Coach. Right right? Here, right? I just want y'all to make sure y'all heard that, right? Right here. Well, I'm curious, Coach. Are there individuals in your network, man, that would really appreciate a bro code experience? And if so, this is the segment we say, call them out. We you to look in that camera right, right there let's do it. and let them know they need to be on the bro code show. Let's do it. Um, I'm calling out. Nice one. Have y'all had nice yet? Nice. Yeah, come yeah, on, yeah. see, get it, get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Look, boy. <laughs> You got to come here. Tia. We need diet. Yeah. Tia, what it is. <laughs> I love Tia. I love Tia. Yeah. So you got to do, do ninth. You got to do Suleiman. Suleiman is doing mm. incredible things with, with the promotion. And it's a, you know, the basketball players and the athletes and entertainers, we get a lot of credit and so on and so forth. But just to highlight brothers like that, like I think he's second generation. Um, concert promoters and okay. you know he's originally from Detroit but he's based down here in the triangle doing outstanding things any concert that comes to this area is him right and so say that name one more time Suleiman what's up boy so he just did the, the uh, he's ah. with black promoters now they just did the new edition Charlie Wilson and uh, Joe DeCie tour and they did the, they had the Maxwell Joe and Anthony Hellman running simultaneously and they wow. ended up being like two of the largest tours um, in America today. So he's right here, man. So just to go inside his mind, and uh, I, I think that'd be incredible. Uh, Sheed, if you out there, boy, I know you hate interviews. Come on, Sheed. I know you hate yeah. interviews. I know you, boy. But if you're looking at me, look, and you owe me this because <laughs> my Steelers beat your Chiefs, and this is oh. so this would be the, this would be the payup right here, man. But come give these outstanding brothers a, a, a great interview right there, man. And so if you ever in Atlanta, yeah, um, or down that way. Banner, you got to go yes, sit down with him. Yes, we love man. it. We need you, David Banner, you, on the Bro Code Show. You got to go sit down with him, man, and, and holler at him, man. It'll be well worth your time, man. Outstanding, pure, authentic. You can be yourself, and that's what it is. So congrats to you, guys. Calling them out, man. We appreciate you, Coach. Hey, well, we always end the show the same way on a positive note. Yes, sir. Today's no different. Today's quote is from Zig Ziglar. It says, if you are not willing to learn, no one can help you. If you are determined to learn, well, stop. Well, it's your boy, bro, Troy. Phil Smith. Bro, Kurt. We are. Bro, go. Another one. Yeah. I was trying to tell you, right?
Barnett, superstar R&B creative, songstress, and lover of 90s R&B music. The one and only Be My Fiasco. From Texas to North Carolina, hear her story of success. Tap in to the Bro Code experience. We all we got. The Bro Code TV show was created to amplify the voices of others and share courageous stories of community leaders, organizations, and businesses that are doing great things. Every Wednesday night at 7 p.m., you can catch Bro Troy, Bro Kirk, and Bro Smith for another courageous conversation. You can find those conversations on our YouTube channel at Bro Code TV Productions and also our audio podcast channels, which are on Spotify, Anchor, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcast at The Bro Code Show. Tap in to The Bro Code Experience. We all we got. The bros just got stronger. We've added a new member to the team, A. Ruth Proctor. The blonde bombshell herself will be hosting this new segment called The Proctor Report. This segment will share behind the scenes footage and engage questions from our listeners from a female point of view. Tap in to the Broco. Stay tuned for a new segment on the Broco show called The Rehash. You'll learn more about the bros personally and what drives them as men and community leaders. The Rehash will be available on YouTube and all audio podcast platforms every Friday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tap in to the Broco. We always say that hope plus options equals success. When there's a lack of hope, oftentimes gravitate towards unfavorable decisions. When we can provide hope plus options, our children will ultimately be better. Uh, Through love, consistency, opportunity, and exposure, that's how we really touch these kids. That's how we empower them, that's how we inspire them, and that's how we encourage them. And that's what we do well here at Y4C. 